Today, it's all about remote cameras with David Bergman on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. And as always, the show notes for this show and every show that I do are up at the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, all you got to do is head down below the like and subscribe buttons, hit those on your way down. I've got some show notes down there, all the links that you're going to need down there. But I will tell you that the show notes that are on YouTube are somewhat limited compared to what you will find. I write an entire blog post about each of my guests. So if you head to the website, you'll you'll find a little bit more there. Speaking of which, my guest today, uh, making their fifth appearance, I mean, third appearance, fifth appearance, It's we'll get into it in a minute. It's the wonderful Canon Explorer of Light, David Bergman. David, how are you, buddy? Hey, Steve. Am I, does that make me the reigning champion? It's either you or Rick Salmon. It's, Ooh, it's one okay. of the two. Yeah. So oh, you're in good Canon company. Explorers of Light. So yes, that is good company to be in. Yeah. And I should say, you and I were talking about it in the green room. This is your third appearance on a normal show and uh, your fifth appearance overall, because you were on the critique shows that I do with uh, Don Komarechka. And then you also contributed to that show I did recently on the best photo advice that somebody has ever given you. So thank you, by the way, for participating in those as well. My pleasure. It um, counts. It counts. Well, and and the shows, the first two shows that you did, this one's on remote cameras, but the first two shows that you did, we did one years and years ago on composition, creativity, and workflow. And then recently we did one of your Luke Combs shots, the uh, the kick of the Diet Coke and Jack Cup, uh, we call it making better action photos. But uh, really good episodes. Links to those are in the blog post over at BehindTheShot.tv. But I, because you've been on so many times, I don't want to go real deep into your bio. Look, at this point, people, if you don't know David Bergman, go watch the past episodes, read the blog posts on each of those episodes. He's kind of everywhere, Canon Explorer of Light, educator. Uh, your current gig is the tour photographer for Luke Combs, but you've worked for pretty much every big name out there. Name some of the other people you've done tour stuff for. I mean, the biggest one before Luke was Bon Jovi. I spent a good, almost a decade on the road with them. So that was that was a kind of a big one. Uh, but before and, that, and Sports then, Illustrated and a couple other tours and yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like you've got, people don't realize with your newspaper background, you've got a really big sports background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I spent I, my, my career so far, it's, I mean, it's been over 30 years now and it, it's kind of in three parts. There was the photojournalist part. I was a newspaper staff photographer at the Miami Herald. And then the, then the middle 10 years was mostly Sports Illustrated was my biggest client really known as a sports guy. But even even in the newspaper days, I was doing a lot of sports and then transitioned into more music. And the last decade or so has been music. And all throughout that, also as an educator, more so today than ever before, but um, you know, teaching and speaking gigs and workshops and that kind of stuff as well. Well, it, it's funny too, because I tell people photographing concerts is much like photographing sports. I mean, you Absolutely. have high jumpers, you have long jumpers, you have hair. I mean, it's amazing. Your education stuff, I want to dive into a, a really quick before we get into the remote camera conversation, because there's two things that you do. And I've said this to you in person. We we were uh, together for dinner in New York recently when my wife and I were vacationing. And I've said this to you many times, but I think that, and I'm not just saying this because I know you, I, I really think this. I think that Ask David Bergman, which you do for Adorama TV, it's on, on Adorama's YouTube channel. I think that may be one of the best resources for photographers to learn from that there is out there today. I mean, up there with any great educational thing out there. Wow. For those that don't know about Ask David Bergman, give the quick helicopter view. Uh, wow, that's high praise. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, basically, I just take photo questions um, that people have submitted, and I do my best to answer them. Um, I think what... What, I, what I'm proud of the most is I've always been relatively good at taking what can be complex topics and boiling it down to why should you care and what's important about it. So I try to do that on the show where people will send in questions that you really could go down a rabbit hole of the science and the math and all that kind of stuff. And I, I try to just break it down like, okay, well, why, why do I care? Well, how do I use this in my daily workflow to make better pictures? Because that's really what it's about at the end of the day. So I try to always keep that in mind when I'm answering a question, no matter what it is. And, and I've seen people ask questions that caused you to end up pulling out a mannequin and, yeah. you know, lighting 
and lighting a mannequin. It's fantastic. The other education thing that you do, which I have participated in, it's been almost a year since I did your shoot from the pit, but shoot from the pit concert photography workshops. Um, it's not like, like I do workshops. I know other people who do workshops. This is totally different from any concert photography workshop you're going to do because of the environment and access. So for those that don't know this, explain that one. Yeah. I mean, I get emails all the time and I have my whole career people saying, how do I get to do what you do? You know, how do I shoot, especially now shooting concerts, people say, how do I get to shoot a concert? And there's really, it's very hard to do. There's very few paths to becoming a concert photographer. And there are very few of us that actually do it full time. So it's an experience that I wanted to offer to my, um, you know, to people to make it available. Um, and I have the advantage of being on the road with Luke Combs as his tour photographer, and he and his management have been so gracious in allowing me to host photographers during the day. I have my own room backstage, and I, I teach a workshop. You're not coming for a Luke Combs experience, or you know, this is you're not going to meet Luke. You're not hanging out backstage with Luke. You're hanging out backstage with me, and I'm gonna and I teach all day. I start with exposure triangle and apertures and shutter speeds and work all the way up to lighting for clubs and remote cameras and more advanced stuff like that. And then at the end of the day, I throw you into the fire and you actually get to shoot the show. You get to photograph Luke's show, all the openers, the entire set, pretty much all access. It's, it's, it's basically unheard of. I have Luke and his management to really thank for allowing me to do that. You know, I came up with the idea and pitched it to them and they, they've allowed me to do it. It's been, I've, I've done about a hundred of them now. So it's, it's wow. been, you know, very successful and people at the end of the night, they come back in the room and they go, oh my God, that was amazing. All right. Like that's my favorite part of the day is to be able to provide that experience for people and they, and people come back, people come back over and over and uh, it's really a fun experience that you can't really get any other way. So uh, that's been very uh, gratifying to be able to do that. Well, and I shoot concerts. It's almost all that I shoot. And I still did the workshop and loved being through the workshop. And one of the guys that was at the Vegas workshop that I did, Mario, just wrote an article for F stoppers on pit etiquette that I recommend people go look up and, and check out because great article and both you and I submitted some things uh, to him. So that brings us to the conversation today. Remote cameras. And, and I should set up a little bit on, on why remote cameras was interesting to me. So twice on this show, I've had guests where I interviewed them and I was talking to them and I, I thought to myself, okay, you know, so tell me about how you took this shot. And the guest would say to me something to the effect of, well, you know, this was a remote camera. And it caught me off guard, mostly because the locations these shots were taken from were entirely places a human could have been holding a camera and taking a photo. It's just that in the environment or the situation they were in, they needed to be in more than one place at a time, but they could have been real cameras. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, real, you know, photography positions. But in music photography, I know a lot of people who use remote cameras. Adam Elmacias uses one, you use them. And I've always been interested in the remote camera angle of things because there are so many tangential things that come in when you're setting up a remote camera. So for those that don't understand the idea of a remote camera, and you use them, correct me if I'm wrong, you use them at every show, right? Pretty much, yeah, almost every, almost every night. Do you, by the way, do you use more than one at a show? So uh, sometimes, yeah. It just depends how inspired I am that day and what I did the night before and how early I wake up, if I get up early enough to put one up in other strange places. But I can, I can go through like sort of the purposes for remotes and, sort of, and how they work. Yeah, yeah, let's go there. What, w explain to people who don't understand why, what, why would I use a remote camera when I'm there? Explain that. Yeah, I mean, this is really something that um, I don't know that legally I can say I was the first one to do it at a concert. But I mean, I was doing this 20 years ago because I have because of the sports background, they're very common in the sports world, but we're not so common in, in the concert environment. And so the a remote camera, all it simply is, is it's another camera with a lens on it that you put somewhere else and you trigger it rem remotely, right? You trigger it from somewhere else. You're not actually holding the camera. That's all it really is. But you can use them. There's really two purposes for them. One is, as you say, to put in a location that you can't otherwise stand, right? I mean, in sports, you put them over the backboard, over the net at a basketball game or in the net at a hockey game, right? You can't obviously be there. That would be awkward. So um, to crouch Although, down inside the net. Depending on game. who's scoring, it could be good. 
<laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that's one reason to do it. And the other reason is also, as you, as you mentioned, you can have multiple remotes going off at the same time. So the last shot of the NBA finals, you know, the Sports Illustrated photographer might take a picture where they are on the baseline, but they might also have 20 or 30 other cameras firing all around the arena overhead and from the sides and up high and down low. And then you've got all these various angles and, you know, some of them might be blocked. Some of them might be, you know, different, not a good angle. And just you're giving yourself as many options as you can when it's a limited thing like that. Like you need that shot of the game winning, you know, uh, three pointer at the, uh, at the NBA finals. You don't want to just chance it and leave it to one, frame that you're taking from your handheld spot. So especially right. if you're working for somebody like Sports Illustrated. So at a concert environment, that's what it is. Now, you know, you don't have that kind of a moment at a concert where it's like, you know, you have to get that game winner, right? Like it is with sports. But for me, it's it allows me to get multiple angles. And more importantly, it allows me to get cameras in places that I wouldn't normally be. So a very common one for me is on the drum riser, on a normal stage, looking out at the crowd, right? So the lead singer sort of has their home base, where their microphone is and they sort of are in that space most often. And then if they turn around or even if they're just looking out at the crowd, I'm out in the crowd taking pictures, looking in, but I have a camera full time behind them and I can trigger that anytime I want. So even though I can go on stage, I'm not there all night, right? So if something cool happens, I can just trigger that camera and get multiple angles and unique angles that maybe other people can't get. So that's, that's one of the things I use to separate myself from, what everybody else might be doing when I have that level of access. Well, and it's interesting because last Friday I photographed the band today to remember I managed to get stage access. Um, they already have a tour photographer. I just know some people and I know the band a little bit. And, and so I was in the wings kind of shooting as the lead singer, Jeremy came over to Alex at the drum riser and he was standing in front of the drum riser. Now from where I am in the wings, I'm thinking, how do I compose this thing? And so I kind of did a frame within a frame where he was between a bunch of different cymbal stands and you've got Alex with his hands up. But I literally at that moment thought to myself, God, a remote camera right now, right at the drum riser as he was walking towards it would have been fantastic, which brings us to today's shot. The shot that we're going to talk about is Luke Combs from a Luke Combs show recently based on the EXIF data that I looked in the date. And this shot is Luke taking a drumstick and hitting the drummer's cymbal. So we're going to get deep into remote cameras and, and all those tangential things that I, I mentioned. But let's let's start with this shot, okay? Because there are some interesting things in here. First of all, it is a remote camera. Um, we'll talk about where it is and everything in a minute, but I want to start with the technical stuff because especially with a remote camera, you set this thing up, you set your exposure, you set your metering, you set your white balance in such a way you can't get up to the drum riser in the middle of this show and change those, right? Correct. Yeah. So let's start with the technical. Exposure wise, the EXIF data says this was 640th of a second. You're setting up a remote camera. You've got amazing light here, right? You're at ISO 3200, you're at F4, you're at 640th of a second. Was there a reason you chose 640th F4 or 3200? Because the lens was a 15 to 35 2.8. Uh, you shot this at 15. Explain to me why you chose that exposure. That's funny. Uh, yeah, so I actually, I mean, I roughly know the light, right? I've shot this show hundreds of times now, I think probably. Um, and, um, you know, I roughly know what the light is going to be. I don't know exactly because it, it's the thing is this stage is a 360 stage. So it's in the middle of the arena. It's not a normal end stage. And the light actually changes quite a bit. The, the riser rotates, it turns. So I don't know exactly what the oh, light's going to yeah. be on his face at that moment, but I know I'm going to be close and I'm shooting raw. I know I'm going to get it close. And just from experience, I know uh, when I set up a remote, usually behind the, the singer, what I will do is I will either go at six sixty four hundred ISO. At I for some reason maybe I don't know I, I don't have OCD, but for some reason I usually keep it. I'm either at sixty four hundred and then at six forty at a four or thirty. So thirty two hundred would be six forty at four. If I went to sixty four hundred, I could go up to twelve fifty at f four. Um, but I felt like I wanted to keep my ISO a little lower in this case. I knew I didn't need, you know, 1250th of a second. So I just figured I just dropped it a stop to 3200 at 
640. Now I could have gone to 2.8 and pushed my shutter speed up to back up to 1250. Um, but 2.8, I was a little nervous about focus. Uh, so I wasn't, you know, I'm not going to be up there to be able to focus. So, uh, I do shoot autofocus. I'm sure that's your next question. Um, this was the, this was the, uh, so yeah, so exposure, it's just from experience and it's a bit of a guess. Um, if I had done this and I looked at it and the end of the night and it was two stops underexposed, then I would try it again the next night and, and change my exposure. So it's really just from experience. As far as focus, I do use autofocus. I've been doing this forever and, uh, most of the time I will autofocus. If you're shooting something like basketball, for example, and you have the, the camera over the net and you're shooting down, you have to pre manual focus that, right? You have to, you have to pick a spot and focus that manually because there's too many faces. There's too much, ha- there's going to be hands in the foreground and all, and you don't know what the camera's going to necessarily focus on, but you know, with basketball where the actions, where the faces are going to be within about a foot, right? You know, the players, right. you shoot basketball enough, you know, the players are going to jump. They're going to be coming in for a slam or they're going to be going for a rebound and they're going to be about a foot to two feet below the rim of the basket. So you might see if you're ever at an NBA game or even a, a big college game early enough, you might see it probably happens too early in the day, but the photographers will get somebody on a ladder, an assistant usually put them on a ladder and have them stand up there and put their face or their hand or they'll hold a card or something that the other photographers can get their focus on and they'll pre-focus that. But with a concert, that person in the foreground is moving around. And I don't know if they're going to be up closer to the crowd or they're going to be right up close to the camera. Like you said, when they come up to the drum kit, they might, you know, they're looking at the drummer, right? And they've got that, that interaction with the drummer and they're going, yeah, baby, you know, and you don't know exactly where they're going to be. So you do have to manual, you do have to autofocus it. Now in the DSLR days, um, the, the widest area autofocus you could go wasn't full frame. It wasn't the entire, uh, frame it wasn't the entire viewfinder, but you know, you could get a big chunk of the middle of the, of the frame. Nowadays I'm using the Canon R5 as my remote and it is by far the best remote camera I've ever used because it's full frame autofocus. So it'll see the entire frame and it's got eye face head body detection. So it sees a person. And it's not if a, you know, if an animal runs through there, <laughs> if a leopard runs through, it's not going to, which, you know, could happen at a concert. Uh, it's not going to pick up on that. It's going to pick up on a person because I have it set for that. So it is by far, I mean, I used to get probably 70 to 80% of my remote frames sharp. Now it's 99. I mean, it's, it's insane how much the focus has, has improved. And with something like a remote camera where I'm not looking through the viewfinder, I don't even think about it anymore. It's just, it just works. It's kind of insane. I, I, I need to ask you then go, going to the autofocus side of it. When you, when you are setting this up, are you, so you're using the largest zone, letting it pick yep. any point that it wants. Yep. Uh, interesting. Okay. And then you've got it obviously on face, eye, eye and face, face detection, head. right? Yep. Which also will detect head and body if it can't see right. an eye or a face. So with that, with that frame, with the frame we're talking about today, if I was, you know, if I didn't have that face eye person detection, it might pick up that mic stand or it might pick up that symbol stand because that's actually closer to the camera. So in this case, it knows that's a person and it's going to pick him up and it's going to focus on him. And I, I, I'd have to go back and look, but I'm pretty sure every single one of those frames was sharp on him, which is just unbelievable. <laughs> it's what, what else is interesting about this, though, is, you know, you, you mentioned the 640th is fine and you, you don't need, you know, higher than that. He's not going to be moving fast. When you're hitting something, you tend to turn more than move off plane. So he's turning. The hand is going to move more than the rest of his body, his hand and his arm. So 640th is more than enough here. It was interesting to me because I know we've talked about this. You shoot uh, auto white balance usually. Mm -hmm. This was manual white balance. Was it? It shouldn't be. No, I I usually shoot auto white balance. Okay. And I, I... and I'm I'm doing a rock and I may have read so, the EXIF wrong then. Yeah, I'm I I I don't think I've touched my white balance in years. I shoot unless I'm doing something that uh, where I'm doing a gelled you know tungsten balance with gels and making the sky blue and that kind of a thing where I want to see it on the camera how it how it I think it'll look in the final. Um, anything else with a concert. I mean, what's the correct white balance on a concert? I, you know, I don't know, right? It's like the lights changing. I, I have constantly. seen YouTube videos where they'll say, "I set my white balance at this or fifty six hundred, and that way they're all the same, and it doesn't change between." Well, the problem with that is, a lot of the shows I shoot nowadays, 
the white balance actually is changing. It's not just the color of the lights. I shoot shows where it's a mix of old, you know, par 64 cans yeah. mixed with LED lighting mix. So sure. actually the, the white balance is changing and it doesn't matter. You can sync it really it easily matter. in post yeah. anyway, but yeah, so, exactly. I'm, so, I'm doing the conversion in post. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, now, well, obviously, again, if I was doing something that was color critical, if I was shooting catalog work or something, I'd shoot a color checker and I'd make sure it was, you know, to the degree Kelvin, you know, but that for a concert, I just wanted to look realistic. I wanted to look like I remember it. I want, you know, if, if, I mean, if the light's red, it's red. If it's blue, it's blue. That's, that's kind of what you want. Well, that's like I see people also with studio lighting and they're like, my studio lights are 5,500. I'm shooting at 5,500, but they're shooting on a $60 studio light and the yeah. odds of it being accurate, actually, if you're yeah. shooting a Coke can and you need that red to be Coca-Cola red, you know, I'd pull out your color right. checker at that point. Th right. This shot, for those of you on the audio feed, let me describe this thing to you. And I I'll tell you right up front, this is going to be the easiest description ever. The <laughs> execution to me on this is really tough. But the description of this, it's not a complex visual by any means. It's Luke Combs. He's centered on the stage. The photo is being taken from the drum riser. So call it the floor. The drum riser is higher than the stage, but it's what the drums are set on. The camera is on that, the drum riser shooting up at Luke. Behind him, and this is something I've shot this show with you, and I completely forgot about the fact it rotates and somehow here you manage to get one of the upper spotlights. So let me start here. Actually, let me back up. So Luke's in the middle. To the left of Luke, Luke, our left, his right, is a mic stand with a mic in it. To the right of Luke, our right, his left, camera right, is a symbol stand with a symbol on it. And you see about half the symbol. In between Luke and the symbol stand is a bright Light, white lights, not colored, which is perfect. Thank God it wasn't red or blue or something because that white light adds a ton to this. There is one other real light in here. It's way upper left corner of the shot above the mic stand. And this is minor. It's, it's, it would be picking nits if I said something different, but I'm actually going to argue that this makes it. That red LED light, you can see the individual LEDs in it. That red LED light is equidistant from the top of the microphone to the symbol. That symmetry there, that little teeny thing, if that was off, my eye would be drawn to this weird red dot randomly placed. But when we get into composition, I'll explain why that red dot being exactly right there really, really matters to me. Now, Luke in the middle is not in front of the light. The light is cleanly on its own. You see its rays coming out towards Luke. He is left hand, his right hand down, our left. Uh, his right hand is down. His left hand is back up with a drumstick. And he is swinging as though he's going to hit that symbol. His body is turned about 30 degrees. And everything about this, again, I'm going to save some of my thoughts on this until we get into the composition part of it. Because so much of this shot to me is everything that needs to be in its place is right where it needs to be, right? I mean, it makes it such a strong image. But based on what we talked about with remote cameras and exposure and stuff, you give us your story on making this shot. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I love the way you describe photos. Nobody does it like Steve Brazel, folks. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I mean, the the story behind this basically is that most shows, almost every night, I mean, I've, again, I've photographed this show over a hundred times now. And, but only recently, I'd say uh, the last year, I started with him at the beginning of 2019, but the last year or so, the end of the song, the last song of the night, usually, uh, every time I can remember, the last song of the end of the encore is beer, his, his big hit called Beer Never Broke My Heart, which is very, you know, a, a great uh, rock, Southern rock country song. Um, it's a big high energy song. It's a loud song. The crowd goes nuts. It's really a lot of fun. And after he's done singing, the band, he will usually go up to the drum kit and Jake Summers, our drummer, will give him a uh, drumstick and then he will start on the beat. He will smash that. I believe it's a China symbol. He will smash that symbol on the beat anywhere from four or five beats to I've seen him do it, you know, 12, 15 times. 
Once in a while, he will then grab the the mic, the the cymbal stand, and throw it down. You know, like he's a like he's in the Who. Uh, you know, forty years ago, right? And and not trash the whole drum kit, but definitely pull that cymbal stand down because he's so hyped up at that moment, and he's screaming and bashing that cymbal, and and then he walks off the stage, and the crowd keeps playing as he walks off the uh, the band keeps playing. And the crowd goes nuts and he walks off the stage. And it's really a fun moment. And I've photographed it all kinds of different ways. Now, again, the challenge here is that this stage on this part of the tour is a 360 stage. So the stage is in the middle of the arena. It's a square. We don't say it's in the round because it's a square. But there are fans on all sides. And and there are four sides to the stage. And then in the middle of the stage, there is a small riser. It's actually shaped like a guitar pick. Um, so it's almost a triangle. It's like longer on two sides than on the third one and has Luke's logo right in the middle of it. And we have three people who are up there, the drummer, the keyboard player, and then Kurt Ozon, when he's playing the steel guitar, he also sits there, although he gets up and down when he's playing guitar. That riser, it's only about a foot off the ground, but it rotates. <laughs> and at various times of the show, depending on the song, sometimes it moves quickly, sometimes it moves slowly during a ballad, and sometimes it doesn't move at all. As a photographer, that is incredibly challenging because I don't know where he's going to be facing and where the band is going to be and who's going to, where anything's going to happen at any point in the show. So that's an extra challenge that this stage gives me that a normal stage does not. Um, so, yeah, so I, I've photographed this moment in the show from a few different angles. There aren't that many angles to get at it. Um, and I just wanted to try to do something different. So I don't know if you want to get right into well, the remote, but yeah, well, you, you actually sent me some behind the scenes or previous shots. So this one you said was a normal shot of Luke from the week before in Louisville, something you do almost every week. So this is how you normally shoot this. Yeah. So we've been doing two nights in every city on this fall tour. Um, and so we did two nights in Louisville and then two nights in Omaha, back to back weekends, Friday, Saturday. And so, yeah, this is quite normal uh, for me. I will either back up and shoot with a longer lens. The stage is quite high. So I actually have the advantage that I can go up a couple of steps. There are on two sides of the stage, there are steps that go onto the stage. That's how the band gets and our crew gets on and off. And I can go up about two or three steps. I can go on the stage, but the 360 stage, there's nowhere to hide. So I don't really like to go onto the stage. It's very rare that I will do that. So normally I shoot it just like this. And this was the picture that I made of it the week before. And this is very typical of what it looks like. I've shot it tighter. I've shot it looser. But this is pretty much the, the only angle that I've really done of it for the most part. Except this one, you actually did go on the stage. So the audience right. got to see all that is David Bergman on the stage. <laughs> Yeah, they did. I mean, nobody, you know, the thing is, I I know nobody's paying attention to me, obviously, and they're watching him. But I uh, very rarely, I think this is only the, maybe the second or third time I've gone on to the 360 stage. Because I just, look, as a photographer, the show's not about me. I don't want anybody to see me. I'm behind the lens. I don't want to be a distraction to the band or to Luke or to any of the fans. But this was the very end of the show. And I just, you know, I, I was already thinking in my head, like, I want to get a different angle on this. And... So I did go on the stage and I have to stand right in the middle of that drum riser and it's rotating and you can see just a little bit of Jake's head there, our drummer, Jake Summers, good friend of mine. And, um, and, but I'm really focused on Luke. I'm concentrating on Luke and I'm just blasting away and trying to get something on him. And Luke's cool about it. He doesn't mind me being up there. Um, but again, I don't want to be a distraction to anybody. So, you know, I was maybe up there for a minute uh, just to get this one moment. And then, and then Luke leaves the stage. So it's a non-issue at that point. Um, so yeah, so that was the, that was a week after the other one you had just showed. This was the first night in Omaha. This was Friday night. And uh, yeah, so then that leads up to then the last, the second night is when I wanted to really do something different. I guess what, when I what, was, I what guess made you decide picture, to go remote though, after, after shooting this, you, you're right there. What made you choose when you looked at this shot, you went, I want to try something else. What was the yeah. trigger in your brain? I, I, I think it was a couple of things. First of all, I didn't love this picture, right? This is, it's okay. And I'm obviously right there, but I, I don't like necessarily looking down on people. It makes them look smaller when you look down on somebody. And yes, I can get lower, but really to get down low, low, I feel like would have been weird. I think if Luke had come up there and started to smash that symbol and I was like crouched down in the drum kit, I feel like I would have been a distraction. So I didn't want to be there during that time. The other thing is I made a shift in my mind, 
I've, I t- I've talked a lot in my workshops about remotes and I've, I've been very honest with everybody about the challenge of a remote camera on this 360 stage, because again, there's no home base, right? There's no sort of guaranteed good shot that I know Luke is going to be in one spot because he's, he walks all around this stage. So I've put cameras on the outside of the stage looking in, I've put them on the inside looking out. And it's just so rare that I get a decent shot from it because it's never lined up right. It's just that with the rotation and the fact that the band's moving all around and Luke's moving all around, it's such a long shot. So I made a shift in my head that night or that day when I was thinking about it um, in that, okay, I'm going to put a remote up, not as an all night, just shoot all night long and try to get some pictures, but I wanted specifically one picture, right? I, I knew that moment in the show. I know where Luke's going to be at that moment in the show. It's one of the few times it might be the only, well, it's, you know, he does a couple of songs in the middle of the stage there um, in the middle of the show. He does a couple of ballads, but other than that, it's one of the, you know, it's one of the few times that I know where he's going to be, or I think I know where he's going to be. So I could preset a camera in a place and have a pretty good chance of getting him there. So I didn't fire that remote all night long. I mean, that that's weird for me. Normally I'm used to whenever I'm watching and I'm seeing, and if somebody steps in front of where that camera is, I'm going to fire that remote. This night, I didn't fire it all night long until this moment. That was all I was really trying to get. Well, and, and again, speaking of it spinning and turning around, you had no idea that light wouldn't be behind the simple stand behind Luke, behind the mic stand, half coming out of his head. And yet you just got so perfect of a shot here. I want to talk about what it takes for setting up a remote camera. But first, let's let's take a look at your remote camera on stage. So yeah, let me just, point out, let me just point out, let me just point out just to your point right there is that that's not the only frame I shot, right? I mean, I'm shooting right. bursts of images through that entire sequence. So I had no idea there was going to be a spotlight there. I didn't know where the, where the lights were going to line up. I didn't even know where really where he was going to be in the frame when I set it up because I had never done that angle before. So yeah, you can see in this picture, which is not a great picture, but I just sent you this to show where that camera is. I put that camera on the ground. I used a platypod uh, floor plate um, on the ground and then a Manfrotto ball head, a very simple setup. And then put the, I've got the R5 with the 15 to 15 to 35 and a pocket wizard on the top. I, I think it's the plus four that I've got on there. Cause it's the low profile one, which I like for that, for that camera. Um, and I set that up between, I have to do it between the, during the changeover, The artist before him, Jordan Davis, finishes, and then there's 25 minutes where our crew uncovers the drum kit because the kit's covered at that point. I can't set that up earlier than that because I have to wait till they uncover it. It usually takes them five, 10 minutes before they even do that. So as soon as I hear Jordan's done, I go out there with my remote and I wait for our crew to uncover the drum kit. And then once they do, I just was looking for a spot to put it. And again, I've never done that angle before, so I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get it. I was really concerned about not having it stick out too much. I didn't want anybody to trip over it. I didn't want somebody to accidentally kick it. Um, so I, I really, you know, wasn't sure exactly where I was going to put it until I went out there and just it's, I tucked the, the platypod under the, there's a, like a rug under the drum kit. So I tucked the platypod under there just a little bit. So it wouldn't hopefully slide around. I do underneath the platypod. I put some, um, I've, I've had it this way for years. Some of that, um, like rubberized, uh, what do you call that? Like drawer, you know, drawer paper that, you know, oh, like a drawer like, mat, like a drawer mat. Yeah. So I've taped that onto the bottom of that platypod because, uh, so that way it doesn't slide around and just gives it a little grip, a little, makes it a little grippy. And, but also I tucked it under the, uh, the rug there and I felt like it was up far enough. I even asked our stage manager cause he was up there working and I just pulled him over and I was like, just eyeball this for me and make sure nobody's gonna, this, this isn't an issue where it is. Right. And he was like, nah, it's fine. So, um, uh, so I so, knew so I was let me, good let me interrupt you for a second. Cause I got to ask. So first of all, the people who make platter putter friends of mine, and if anybody ever needs one, they do make, uh, it comes in the accessory kit, a rubber pad that you can do, but it's not stuck on the bottom. So sticking on the right. bottom is a great idea, but also all the platypod versions come with screw in spikes that raise the front up. I'm guessing in this case though, it's not a steep enough angle is why you need. Uh, yeah. Towel. I actually, I actually don't use those spikes uh, because first of all, they are really sharp, which is amazing if you're out in the woods and you know, hanging you on, a rock, on a yeah. rock, right. You want to put it on a rock. 
I am never doing that. I don't want to damage anything on the stage. And they would. I mean, they're very, very sharp. So um, uh, so I don't use those. I'm just using the flat plate. Now You on can top flip of them the dough, upside down and put the rubber stopper down. You can, you, but, but then, then you have you a spike sticking out the top. A spike sticking up. And if one of our crew members goes to grab that for me or something, I don't want them to put their hand through it. So I don't even travel with those. They're gone, right? So it's just a floor plate. But I put a Manfrotto ball head on there. So the ball head, I can move and I can angle that camera however I want. It's not like the camera's just flat on the ground and I can't adjust it. So I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't adjust it with the, with the spikes anyway. I would probably rather do it. I feel like that might you know, mess with the center of gravity a little too much. So I'd rather do it with the ball head anyway. Um, so I, that's how I'm adjusting. So I've got it angled up on that ball head. Okay, that makes total sense. So let's, let's do this then. Uh, before we get into composition on this, because the composition again, this is, if people go look at David's website, davidbergman.net, if people go look at David's website, you're going to, this is what I do with all the people that I know, really. I go through their website kind of over and over to find common threads. And one of the things David's got down in a way, I always find things that are kind of, I think, subconscious to a point. You've done it so many times, it's muscle memory. But one of the things that David has down is compositional structures. And we'll get into that in a second. First of all, remote shooting, not the camera and lens so much yet. Let's talk about the tangential hardware, et cetera, that you need to mount or place a remote camera on a drum riser, on a table, on the floor, suspending it from something. Uh, you mentioned a platypod. That obviously is a small plate that you can mount a ball head on and put the camera on. And they're fantastic. I love platypods. I've got about four of them. But what else do you need based on where you're going to put something? So there are numerous ways. I've done it a lot of different ways. So the simplest way, I've done remotes I'm at basketball games. I would sometimes put a remote. You know, you're sitting on the baseline shooting with maybe a 7200 or a 2470 or whatever. But then you might want a wide angle lens at your feet, right? Like literally in your lap you know, right in front of your lap on the ground because it's a nice low angle and you can shoot wide. I've done that because I want it on the ground. Even, even the height of a ball head, I feel like is too high, right? So if you want a camera all the way on the ground, I've done it where literally I took, I still have it somewhere. I took like four of those hard cases that you put um, uh, CF cards in, right? You know, those, those like travel cases mm -hmm. and the hard ones, the, those like PVC, whatever those are made of plastic. And I've taken four of those and wrapped it in gaffer's tape and it's just a little platform, right? And then I put it so the camera the, the camera body is on the ground and that height is just perfect to put the lens on and the camera's just aimed up at the right angle, right? And it's as low as you can get because it's literally on the ground and just angled up with the, with the lens. So I've done it. You can do it as simply as that, right? That you just have One to have of my some favorite way ways is a, a beanbag, like a large beanbag. Yeah. You can Beanbags stand it on its good. side, sit the lens into the beanbag, and the beanbag wraps yeah. around the lens, yeah. and it'll hold it as well. That, that's a much more elegant way to do it than what I just said. But yes, that is that is definitely a way to do it. I just wanted the body on the ground. I think even the body lifting up two inches, like on a beanbag, I think is too much, right? If you're if you want that really really low angle, so that's one way to do it. The second way is again, yes, with a with a, a floor plate like the platypod. I do love the platypod. I've been traveling with it for years, and a ball head. That's easy. Um, the most common way that I've done it uh, over the years is using a Manfrotto super clamp and a magic arm. So uh, a super clamp is just this metal clamp that you can ratchet down and it's very strong and you can attach it to almost anything. You will damage things if you, if you tighten it too hard. So you can, you know, I would never attach it to like a cymbal stand because you're going to scratch it or bend it, but like an old mic stand or something like that, it's no problem or any kind of metal on a stage or anything like that. I've done that. And then the magic arm is basically an articulating arm that you put the camera on the end of it. You attach it to the clamp and then the other end you put the camera on and you can aim it at any, you can move it to any angle you want and then you tighten it down and it locks all the joints in place. So those things are made really well. That I have three or four of these Manfrotto super clamp magic arm Manf combos. The, the magic arms come, correct me if I'm wrong, they come with a single joint with two, you know, extensions or they also have two joints where you have three extensions, right? Uh, the the ones that I always use are 
it's just it's just one joint with the two ends, and then you can buy them with whatever kind of plate you want on one of the ends. And there's one that's just a flat plate that I you can either I, I've used it to attach flashes to. You know the little foot that comes with a with a speed light uh, screws in there perfectly. I've done that if I want to put a flash in a weird place. You know, at somebody's house, you can attach to a bookcase or wherever right. you want. Um, so I've done that. And then at the other end, you just attach the super clamp. Um, I'm sure there are various iterations of it. My favorite one sidebar, um, with the magic arm, there are two kinds. There's one that has just like a, a single, I don't know how to explain it, like a ratchet where it just like is open or closed. And then there's another one that's got a circular tension thing that you can tighten. That's the way to go. The one with the, the circular one with the tension. I find that that other one over time starts to lose its its grip and you have to tighten it with a, you know, you need to use a tool to tighten it up. The the one with the with the tension uh, circle on it, <laughs> I'm sure there's an elegant name for that, um, works much better. And I have a bunch of those. But um, so that is another way to do it because I can, I've put that in, in a drum kit on Bon Jovi. I would, I would attach it to a mic stand and I had a sandbag that I would put in there to make sure everything, nothing, you know, fell over onto the drum kit. And I would just angle it out. And so it was facing out in the crowd. It was basically buried in the drum kit. And it would, and it would just peek out enough to, uh, that I could do that nice wide shot from that angle, which was dead center in the stage. So it was really, really nice that way. And I actually have a super clamp sitting next to me that holds, you can get, so the super clamp has a hole in it that's like octagonal. You put down and there's a little tightening screw. And I have a large, like 24, 36 inch gooseneck. Yeah. That comes off of that, that I have a magnetic phone mount for. And that's my top down camera when I do an unboxing. They're useful for everything. But what about if yeah. you need to put it up high? Like you get there early enough. By the way, speaking of early enough, I got to back up to when you said you you put that camera, uh, you know, this camera right here, that you put that camera there in between a set change. Could you, since it was covered, could you not have set it up before they covered it? I could have, but there's always the risk of when they uncover it that it gets moved, right? Because gotcha. okay. it's just a big black curtain over it, and I don't, you know, I don't want them to have to worry about, you know, I don't want to worry about it. I don't want them to have to worry about, it. you know, if they move a symbol, they're the guys that set up the symbol, so they're gonna they're gonna put it right back wherever it was. But just uncovering it, I feel like there's too many, you know, too many things that could go wrong that way. So why why bother? So what if you got there early enough to fly it in the truss? So all yeah. the lighting at a concert's on what's called truss. It's on the ground, comes off an 18-wheeler. They've Everything's mounted on it, and they chain it up all the way up high. I know you've mounted those before because recently you posted, you've posted a ton of shots over the years, but you posted an amazing shot where you actually got the whole stage in, which is in the blog post, by the way, behind the shot.tv. It's there, I've got a gallery of David's work there, and that shot's in there. But, or it is Instagram for that matter. What about when you fly it in a truss? What do you need to worry about as far as, okay, you got the super clamp, you got the magic arm, you got the camera on there and God forbid that tightening mechanism loosens and it falls. What do you do to secure something to where you don't worry about it? Yeah, of course you've got to have it safety up there. Anything you're going to hang over, you know, up high, whether it's over people's heads or not, you've got to have a safety cable of some type. So there are, you know, traditional safety cables that you can use. I've done it, honestly, uh, you know, mo most of the time I will use the camera strap. And the strap, I will make sure that it's attached to the camera with multiple loops. And, you know, it's not just like one time through there, right? It's in there. It's twisted around. It's all, I've got that all tightened. And then I will wrap that strap around one of those metal bars. Okay. Um, so, yes, I mean, it, 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 it's only a matter of time before it, that happens. It will fall at some point. So uh, hopefully never, but, it, you know, you've got to prepare for that. So, yeah, there's, there's always safety at least once, if not twice, um, up there with multiple ways so it doesn't hit anybody. The possibility is you put a camera somewhere in a crowd, in the seats, something like that, where somebody could bump it or steal it. Do you do anything specific to prevent, because you're walking away from the camera, right? Anything yeah. to prevent theft or damage? I don't know that I would put it somewhere where the general public could just get at it. I've put uh, speed lights up in... Uh, you know, on the railings before in like a theater to light the crowd. Um, and what I'll do with that is, you know, look, there's a bit of a trust thing that has to go on there. Sometimes I'll actually go up there and the people sitting near it and I'll actually introduce myself and I'll say, Hey, by the way, there's a flash here. And, you know, and I'll joke like, don't let anybody steal it, you know? And, and it just, so they know, like I'm watching. Right. So, I, you know, it just, it just helps a little bit, but, um, 
I will safety it. And I've gone so far as to just gaffer tape it like crazy. You know what I mean? Like run, you know, just run gaffer tape around everything and attach to the thing. It's just get, it's going to make somebody work a little harder. Obviously anything can be stolen from anywhere, but right. most of the time I'm putting cameras on the stage or overhead or some places where the general public can't just simply grab it and walk away. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would never do that. So with that in mind, let's talk about the camera. You use an R5. The lens on this particular shot we're talking about today was a 15 to 35, an RF 15 to 35 2.8, although you shot it at F4. Do you have, I mean, do you always go around 15? I know that you happen to own an 8 to 15. Do you ever go wider? What what is your what is your choices generally for body, lens, and triggers? Yeah. So my handheld cameras now, I'm using R3s. I have two R3 cameras that I'm wearing over my shoulders, and that's what I'm shooting with. The R5, like I said earlier, I is the best remote camera I've ever used. And not only because of the focus issue, but also the megapixels, the number of megapixels. A remote is a bit of a crapshoot, right? You really don't know what you're gonna get. And so I, the 15 to 35 is my, the, the lens that I use the most on that remote camera because I can, I can afford to shoot a little wider and I don't know where they're going to be in the frame, right? I, it's, it's, you just don't know with a remote. I'm not actively looking, looking through the lens. I'm not moving the camera. So um, I'd rather shoot a little wider with a lens like that 15 to 35 and then I have some cropping space, right? I, I don't want to crop if I don't have to, but uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to give myself a little room and then I can, because I've got 45 megapixels in that camera, I can crop into that no problem. So um, so I that 15 to 35 is my most common remote camera. If I'm using something else in that, it's because I'm really trying to do something in particular like that 8 to 15, that's an EF lens, but with the adapter, it's no problem on the R5. Um, that was a fisheye that I was trying to do overhead and get the whole stage in there because it's a it's a low truss. And by the way, it's exactly true what you said. I'm putting that camera on the truss early in the morning when our crew is out there. They work incredibly hard. They get up early and they set up when 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 we come into an arena in the morning. It's empty, and they we have people who climb up to the rafters and they drop down the rigging points. And, and then all the stuff is built on the ground and then it's raised up and then the stage is brought in underneath it. So, um, I, if I get there at the right time, I can go in and pick a truss and put my camera on it, but it's, you're not looking through, you know, you just kind of guess from experience and on how to angle it and how to aim it. And then they raise that up and you go bye-bye and, and hope for the best. Um, it really is, you know, you don't always know what you're going to get. Now, again, with experience, with years of doing this, I have a good idea of what I'm trying to get, but sometimes it's a surprise. <laughs> well, which then let's talk triggers then because it's remote. You've got to trigger it somehow. You're using pocket wizards. How are you using that? So you can use a pocket wizard where you put it on your camera and whenever you take a shot, it triggers something remotely or you can manually trigger it. Do you have a preference? Yeah. So most of the time, depending on what I'm shooting, most of the time what I do is actually I have one right here. Um, by coincidence, this is the plus three. Um, so I have one that I travel with that I have a little S hook that I put on there. Um, so it's just got a little metal hook that comes off here and my photo credential, my, my, you know, all access tour pass. Um, I will actually take this with that hook and I will hang it on the end of that. So this is literally hanging on my neck all night long and it's kind of muscle memory. You hit the test button and that will fire that remote. I have another one on the camera. Like I said before, I'm using the plus four usually on the camera. It's instead of pointing up, it's one that actually lays down flat. Right. And I just feel like it's a little more low profile. Um, so that one's on the camera. So all you need is the, you need obviously two. These are transceivers, so you can use them either, either as a transmitter or receiver. The old days you had to buy one transmitter or one receiver. Now they, they flip back and forth easily. Um, so, uh, so you can just need two of them and then you need the right cord for your camera. So the Canon, there's a specific cord that goes into the sort of the high end Canons, the 1D series and the, 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 the fives and yeah, the R5, the R3, they all have the same remote port. And so you just have to get that the right cord for your camera. And then whenever I hit that test button, that camera's going to fire. Now the thought process is if I'm in the crowd looking in to the stage and then I have a camera behind the singer on the drum riser looking the other direction, I'm going to wear this and I'm going to trigger it separately, right? Because if the artist turns around, right. 
that's when I want to take the picture. I'm just going to reach up and hit that button. If I then go on the stage, which I've done this plenty of times, I go on stage and maybe I have that wide shot in the drum kit, but I'm also standing a little bit further away. Maybe I'm shooting tighter, you know, longer lens. I will then literally take this off of my pass and stick it on top of my camera. And as you said, the, the hot shoe, I can, that, that what will happen then is when I take a picture, it will also trigger this, which then triggers the other camera. So if I had 10 other remote cameras, they would all fire at the same time when I took a picture. So if I'm at the same angle or the same, you know, so, you know, same roughly, same rough angle, and I want them both to fire at the same time, that's how I'll do it. So what about pitfalls? We've talked about a lot of them, yeah. but are there any pitfalls we didn't mention and then I want to get into after that, and there may not be any, but if there's any pitfalls, let's start there. Any pitfalls? Yeah. I mean, yeah, remote cameras, you can never depend on a remote camera as your primary picture, right? It's it's a secondary, it's icing on the cake because there are so many things that can go wrong with remotes. I actually, I don't know if you remember, but at the end of one of your shows, we did a little sort of outtake, which I think you posted, where I told a story about a remote at a very important event. Uh, it was the halftime show of the Cowboys game that Luke was playing. And I had two remotes on stage and neither of them fired at all during the show. And I, the reason is there was too much RF interference. There's all kinds of radio frequency interference at a TV event. And, you know, I, I had no idea it wasn't firing, right? I mean, it was six and a half minutes, the show. It fired before. I tested it. It fired before. It fired after as the state, as everything was coming out. And until I looked at the pictures and said, oh, there's nothing there between the frames before and the frames after. So, and I realized on either remote. So there are all kinds of things that can go wrong. You know, the, the camera can move. It can get bumped by somebody. It can, you know, completely change position. Uh, the battery could die. You got to be real careful with batteries. What I do with that is I use the energy saver mode. So the camera actually goes to sleep during the day. If I have to set it up early in the morning, um, it will go to sleep. And then once I hit that test button, it wakes it up just like as if you were hitting the trigger button on the camera. Right. If you shoot sports, you can't do that because for sports, you have to use a different cable that Pocket Wizard makes. They call it a pre-trigger cable. And that actually keeps the camera awake. It's almost like a half button press constantly. And that's because when you need that picture of LeBron you know, slamming the ball to get the game winner, you can't take a second to have that camera wake up. You need it to fire immediately to the millisecond, right? So uh, sports photographers use that pre-trigger cable. That does kill your battery. So in that case, if it's somewhere where you can't access it and you, you know, at the Olympics, they set up a remote and they leave it up there for three weeks, that's running off AC power. They're plugged into AC power. There's no other way to do it. Um, ideally, if it's a camera you can get to, you leave it turned off during the day and then right before the game starts or right before things starts, you just walk over and you turn it on. I've done that before. Um, but for a concert, I don't, I don't need that kind of reaction time. Uh, so I will just set it on energy saver. Don't use a pre-trigger cable and I can just wake it up when I, uh, when I'm ready to shoot. So then the big question is for this shot, or if you're hanging it on a truss that's on the stage and then they raise that truss way up in the air how do you get focus for something way up there? And how did you get focus for this? Obviously, yeah, this so is tracking eye and, eye and face. But yeah. let's say that you were doing manual focus for some reason. How do you choose your focus? I mean, I wouldn't do manual focus on this. But, if, but like I said, with something like basketball, you just have to know what you're shooting, right? And you have to know the sport. You have to know. If I knew, you know, Luke always stands in exactly the same spot. If he, let's say the, the riser only extended a certain distance and I knew he had to be right at the end of it, then I technically could pre-focus on that, you know, beforehand. I, I don't know that I would, you know, again, nowadays the autofocus is so good. The right. only exception I think would be, um, you know, like I said, when you've got something where there are going to be hands in the foreground and a lot of, you know, faces and you don't know which one it's going to focus on. Um, that I would probably pre-focus or, you know, in the net at the net at a hockey game, like I said before, when you're inside the net, you've got the back of the goalie, right? And if you, if you don't manual focus that it's always going to focus on the goalie and you don't want that. You want it to focus out, out in front of the net, probably, you know, six feet or 10 feet or something so that you're getting the guy shooting into the net, not the back of the goalie. Right. Um, okay. So that's, you just have to know what you're, you know, your sport and know what you're shooting and, and figure it out from that. By the way, one more sidebar. Um, I don't know if I told you about this uh, on a personal level, but uh, there's one more way to put up a remote. So I, I've done it all the ways we've mentioned, but I was earlier this year, we were doing some uh, stadium shows over the summer 
and I put up a high remote behind the stage and, you know, in the back way up at the top. And honestly, that was too high because we had some trusses that were lower than it. And I just couldn't get a good angle from the center position. Those trusses were blocking too much. So I wanted to be kind of lower, but not, but still in the back and still up high. So I could see the big crowd because we were playing stadiums. And so, uh, and below that truss was our LED, you know, our, our big TV, not TV, you know, our big uh, LED wall. So I couldn't mount it in the middle of the LED wall. So what I actually did was I went out and bought a 40 foot tripod. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I bought a 40 foot tripod and because I can go out on stage, I don't know that I would do this with every artist I've ever worked for, but with Luke, I, I knew I could probably get away with it. So I off to the side, I, I got this tripod set up. I put a ball head on the top of it. I put the camera on the pocket wizard. I got it all ready. And at a moment in the show, when I knew there might be, you know, some house lights or something that would make for a good picture, I ran out there. I raised this tripod all the way up. I'm standing right there. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. And it's like, you know, moving back and forth because I've got a heavy camera at the top of this thing. And I didn't go all the way up. I didn't go to 40 feet. That made me a little nervous. But I went at probably two or three sections on this tripod. And I took the picture with the remote. And then I brought it back down and I could, and I had the advantage. I could look at it and go, oh, you know, it wasn't quite aimed right. So I, I repositioned it again, hiding behind the drum kit, waiting for something and then bring it back up again. Boom, boom, bring it back down. I've got the picture and I got out of there and I put the tripod away and uh, you know, it's, it's, you gotta be resourceful, right? I, I have the access. I have the ability to do it. And again, I'm not going to stand out there all night with that. I'm, you know, I'm going to pick my moments, but I was able to make pictures from a relatively high angle so that I could see that we had 80,000 people out there, 70,000 people right. out there, but you know, I couldn't, I couldn't put it up early. So in a way that was a lot easier. It was nerve wracking, but it was a lot easier because I could actually see it. I could check it. You know, and I didn't leave the stage till I knew I had the picture. So that was, that was kind of unusual for a remote. Usually you have no idea. So let, let's jump into composition because the composition on this shot, to me, it's all about relationship balance, right? You've got the mic stand on, the, on our left of Luke. You've got the cymbal stand on the right of Luke, which, by the way, you've got the mic stand, Luke, and the cymbal stand. That's the rule of odds. You've got a frame within a frame. Because you have the mic stand on the left, the cymbal stand on the right, the cymbal comes over the top of his head, and then continuing that frame is that red LED, so it makes a perfect frame. That LED, if it was farther to the left, would break that, but it's not. Accident, I don't care. It's perfect that that cymbal stand comes up. I'm drawing in air right now, which is really hilarious. <laughs> the cymbal stand comes up, goes over the cymbal, uh, hits the red light, immediately comes down and goes down that mic stand. Absolutely love that. The Yeah, there's just so much compositionally here. And then you've got Luke equidistant between pretty much the two stands. The light happens to be filling the side that's a little bit wider between him and the, the symbol instead of him and the mic. You can see some text. And what's interesting also because of the angle that you're at is Luke's in focus. So are the, the AA on the symbol. Because even though the symbol's closer technically, because you're aiming up, they're basically on the same focal plane at F4. You, you get this thing back, you pull it up on your computer, what would you have done post-processing wise to this image? Yeah, almost nothing. It's really just a crop. So obviously, like, like I said, I'm shooting bursts. I'm shooting this whole sequence. I'm basically holding down the pocket wizard and just firing away. Um, I don't remember what I had my um, frame rate set at. I was probably at 12 frames a second. I'm not shooting 30. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> I don't need 30. So you're mechanical but then? I'm mechanical, yes. I do shoot mechanical. Uh, at these concerts because the LED lights do pulse and the electronic shutter makes them makes it a lot more obvious. Um, you do still see it in the right or the wrong lighting situations uh, with the mechanical shutter. Actually, the first frame you put up of Luke uh, hitting the symbol the week before, you can actually see those LED uh, scan the strobes. lines. Not scan yeah. lines, but yeah. So... Um, yeah. So, and that's with the mechanical, with the electronic, it would be a lot more pronounced. So, um, so I shoot all mechanical at these shows, but yeah, so I'm bursting through. And then when I'm, when I'm looking through the images 
first I'm looking at Luke, right? I mean, he's my priority. I want to find a good moment because a lot of it is, you know, post hit or, you know, uh, it just, you know, not just doesn't work. Right. So I'm looking for action. I'm a action photographer. I shot a lot of sports. I'm looking for sort of that peak moment. I mean, I like this because if you were sitting right there, I mean, you're the viewer of the picture and it looks like he's about to smash you with a drumstick. Right. (laughs) So that's, that's kind of the moment that I like of him. And then after that, I'm going to sort of, if I have two, three, four frames that I really like of him, then the deciding factor is going to be all those other things you mentioned, the composition and where he is in the frame. And the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, like the original frame of this is all, everything you're seeing there is basically the right half of the frame. So I, because I pre lined up this shot without him there and without any action happening and just, you know, before the show started, I don't, I didn't really know exactly where he's going to be. This is honestly the first time I had put a camera at this position. So I didn't really know if he was going to be further over to the left. I didn't know if he was going to be blocked by that mic stand. I didn't even know if that mic stand was still going to be there at that time. I, I didn't know enough to know if that's a stand that they move around. Cause we have some stands that get moved during the show. I'd never shot it from this angle. So I wasn't sure if that mic stand was still going to be there um, or exactly where he was going to be. So it's, it's a bit of an educated guess. Um, and so when I got the, the, you know, when I got the frames back and I was looking through them, the left of that mic stand, you know, that to the right is the edge of the frame. So the left is pretty much just blackness. There's nothing there. So I normally prefer to leave my images in that two by three, um, aspect ratio, just cause I like, I think that's a pleasing horizontal aspect ratio. I don't normally crop into squares. I think squares are not always the most um, powerful. But in this case, the I teach in my workshops, I always say, fill the frame, look at your entire frame, make sure every pixel is in there for a reason. And the entire left side of the frame was just darkness. It was nothing there. So I just cropped it out and made it into a square. And, and then, yeah, well, like I said, once I have two, three, four frames that I like the way Luke looks, then I'll have those other factors be the deciding factor as far as which frame to go. And I love that you love that red light because I do as well too. I mean, it's, it's tempting sometimes to to take something like that out of there. I don't do that because I'm an old newspaper photographer. So I don't, I don't manipulate my photos like that, but I know some photographers that might remove that or, or take that. But I, you know, first of all, the fact that I wouldn't do it in the first place, but I like where it is as well. So it it definitely does wrap you into the frame and it brings, it pushes your eye right in towards the middle instead of having that sort of dead space over there. It's funny what you say about square because on occasion I'll crop a shot square because it just calls it, 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 you know, yells at me. I need to be square, but it's just the same reason that I don't tend to shoot portrait orientation on a camera. My brain sees landscape orientation two three ratio. That's how my brain sees through the viewfinder. That's how I frame it as interesting. Let's switch gears And go into a speed round. Now, you've done this speed round multiple times. Uh So although the first time you were on, I wasn't doing this, but you've done this before. So I've switched up a couple of them. But first of all, what is your top remote camera tip? Top remote camera tip. Uh, uh, Try something different every time. You know, don't do the same. Don't make the same picture every time. That's the whole point. Put it in different places and you never know what will happen. Speaking specifically to concert photography, what's your most important pit etiquette rule? Uh, oh God, there's so many. Um, um, just be be courteous to the other photographers. Don't don't wear a big backpack that as soon as you turn around, you're going to take out three people and nobody can get past you. Let the other photographers pass you. I'd rather be the guy. If you want this spot, you can have it. I'll go six feet that way, and I'm still going to make a better picture than you. <laughs> Yeah, I I completely agree. And again, the the word I used when when Mario asked me was respect. You got to have respect, respect for everybody totally. in their security, the artist, totally. the audience. Yes, there's going to be times you block somebody in the audience for a second, yeah. but you have to be aware of it. You have to be aware of your. It's a workspace. You have to be aware of what's happening. Uh, yep. What is your favorite composition rule if you have one? Oh boy, um, favorite composition rule. Um, I, I think it's important to know where uh, your subject is in the frame if they're he- if they're, and where they're looking, right? If they're, he- if they're at the edge of the frame looking out, it adds some tension to your image. If they're 
at the edge looking in, it's a little more smooth. It's a little more natural. Um, neither is right or wrong. It's just a personal choice. So if you put somebody at the edge of the frame looking out, it's going to just add a little, little, little grit, little tension, but that's something don't do that by accident. Make that decision because you want it that way as a creative, as a photographer, that's up to you to decide where that your subject is in the frame. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite piece of photography gear. Oh boy. Favorite piece of photography gear. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm not much of a gearhead. I do own everything, but, um, but I'm not a huge gearhead. Uh, favorite piece of photography gear. Wow. Um, you know what? I mean, it can be as simple as, as it's not photography gear, but like gaffer's tape. Gaffer's tape, I always have gaffer's tape on me. I've probably said this to you before. I always have gaff tape on me. You could always use it for something, whether you're marking a spot or making sure a cord doesn't come out of something or you know, taping down focus or whatever it is. I always have the little tiny rolls of gaff tape and the big rolls of gaff tape. I always have them with me. It's not photo gear, but my favorite thing that I would never, I, I would never be without. I would argue it is photo gear. The, the 15 to 35, the RF 15 to 35 2.8 is one of my favorite lenses. And I lost the lens hood. Now the Canon lens hoods click on, they lock, but hanging on a strap, it must've bumped the button. I lost it, cost me 60 bucks to buy a new one. I got the new one. The next show, I looked down and it's off. Luckily I found it. I now gaffers tape my 15, only the 15 to 35 lens hood. I gaffers yep. tape that one on. Yep. You're as, putting your fan hat on, not your photographer hat, but your fan hat. What is the best live show you've ever seen? Oh boy. Uh, I think that's, I know this one. This is, I saw Sting with a 50 piece orchestra at Carnegie Hall. And Ooh. that was, that was, that was heaven. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big Sting fan to begin with. And that orchestra tour, he's done that a few times. I probably saw that show four or five times over the years but when it was at Carnegie Hall, it was, uh, I mean, that's obviously a, the most amazing venue it, just down the street from, from uh, my studio, actually. And uh, uh, yeah, that was pretty much heaven. I'd say that was one of, that's one of the best shows I've ever seen. Okay. And last but not least, is there a photographer out there that you think more people should follow? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, I mean, there are so many. Um but that's, it's hard to pick one. Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a young photographer who's on the road with Morgan Wallen right now, who I met David Lair. And, uh, he's a, he's a hell of a concert guy. He shoots video as well. Um, I think most young photographers now are doing video and stills, but, um, but he's, you know, he's with a great artist who's, who's, you know, had a huge rise just like Luke. And uh, they actually opened for us a few years ago, and I, I got to know him a little bit. And uh, he's a really good shooter. I love following his work. So I think that's there's so many out there, but I, I'd say I'd say David. All right, perfect. And just to remind everybody, all the show notes, all the links, uh, they will all be at the blog post at behindtheshot.tv. If people want to find you, where can they find, first of all, what's your website? Uh, yeah, davidbergman.net is the, the website, which hasn't been updated in a while, but uh, I'll get to it one of these days. Okay. And then let everybody know your social media and shoot from the pit and ask David Bergman. Yeah. And Instagram is probably the best. So that's the one I update the most. Uh, it's just at David Bergman. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the workshops. Yes, that is a huge one. Shootfromthepit.com. I'm still running those. Uh, we're just about the end of 2022 now and, and I only have a, uh, a few left. But uh, stay tuned. We'll see what I'm doing next year. There's an email list. If you get on that email list, you'll be the first to know when new workshops are announced. And then, uh, yeah, Ask David Bergman's on the Adorama YouTube channel. So you just uh, you can just Google Ask David Bergman or go to YouTube slash, you know, dot com slash Adorama. Not just me, man. There's so many great shows on there every week. Lots of great hosts um, who, uh, you know, have shows all week long. And obviously, it's all free and, and great stuff. So uh, Adorama's done a really good job. I've been with them. This is the end of my end of year seven that I've been doing shows for them. So I did two minute tips uh, for about three for three years, and then ask David Bergman. Now it's been four years. Um, it's insane. Something like three hundred and thirty, three hundred and forty uh, shows so far, and still going. So that's uh, that's been fun. So thank you to Adorama for that. What I love is the the ask David Bergman's. Just go watch the back catalog because there's amazing stuff in there that's timeless. It's not date sensitive in any way. And then of course. 
AskDavidBergman.com you can do. Shoot from the Pit, I have done. I didn't get it because I'm a friend of David's. I paid for Shoot from the Pit, and it was worth every damn dime I paid. So if you're looking for a fun workshop to do, uh, if you're looking for kind of an intro or understanding of live music photography, cannot recommend it enough. And uh, David, thank you so much for doing this, man. I appreciate all the times you've supported me in this podcast, and uh, I just appreciate knowing you. In fact, I got so into this just kind of listening to you and having a conversation. There's a couple of times I left the wrong scene up because I'm just <laughs> having fun. So thank you very much for doing this, dude. Thanks, Steve. Love you, brother. To everybody, keep in mind, you can get this show wherever you get your podcasts. It's available in either audio only or a video format. Of course, the video is also up on YouTube. All you got to do is go to youtube.com slash behind the shot. Behind the shot.tv is the website. Once again, thank you to my guest, David Bergman. And make sure you join us each and every show as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. <laughs>